Section 11 of Chapter 21 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 21, Section 11. With the fate of the law which restored the currency was closely connected the fate of another law, which had been several years under the consideration of Parliament, and had caused several warm disputes between the hereditary and the elective branch of the legislature. The session had scarcely commenced when the bill for regulating trials in cases of high treason was again laid on the table of the Commons. Of the debates to which it gave occasion, nothing is known except one interesting circumstance which has been preserved by tradition. Among those who supported the bill appeared conspicuous a young Whig of high rank, of ample fortune, and of great abilities which had been assiduously improved by study. This was Antony Ashley Cooper, Lord Ashley eldest son of the second Earl of Shaftesbury, and grandson of that renowned politician who had, in the days of Charles the Second, been at one time the most unprincipled of ministers, and at another the most unprincipled of demagogues. Ashley had just been returned to Parliament for the borough of Poole, and was in his twenty-fifth year. In the course of his speech he faltered, stammered and seemed to lose the thread of his reasoning. The house, then as now, indulgent to novices, and then as now, well aware that, on a first appearance, the hesitation which is the effect of modesty and sensibility is quite as promising a sign as volubility of utterance and ease of manner, encouraged him to proceed. How can I, sir, said the young orator, recovering himself, produce a stronger argument in favour of this bill than my own failure? My fortune, my character, my life are not at stake. I am speaking to an audience whose kindness might well inspire me with courage, and yet from mere nervousness, from mere want of practice in addressing large assemblies, I have lost my recollection. I am unable to go on with my argument. How helpless, then, must be a poor man who, never having opened his lips in public, is called upon to reply, without a moment's preparation, to the ablest and most experienced advocates in the kingdom, and whose faculties are paralysed by the thought that, if he fails to convince his hearers, he will, in a few hours, die on a gallows and leave beggary and infamy to those who are dearest to him. It may reasonably be suspected that Ashley's confusion and the ingenious use to which he made of it had been carefully premeditated. His speech, however, made a great impression and probably raised expectations which were not fulfilled. His health was delicate, his taste was refined even to fastidiousness. He soon left politics to men whose bodies and minds were of coarser texture than his own, gave himself up to mere intellectual luxury, lost himself in the mazes of the old academic philosophy, and aspired to the glory of reviving the old academic eloquence. His diction affected and florid, but often singularly beautiful and melodious, fascinated many young enthusiasts. He had not merely disciples, but worshippers. His life was short, but he lived long enough to become the founder of a new sect of English freethinkers, diametrically opposed in opinions and feelings to that sect of freethinkers of which Hobbes was the oracle. 
during many years the characteristics continued to be the gospel of romantic and sentimental unbelievers, while the gospel of cold-blooded and hard-headed unbelievers was the Leviathan. The bill, so often brought in and so often lost, went through the commons without a division, and was carried up to the lords. It soon came back with the long-disputed clause altering the constitution of the court of the Lord High Steward. A strong party among the representatives of the people was still unwilling to grant any new privilege to the nobility, but the moment was critical. The misunderstanding which had arisen between the houses touching the recoinage bill had produced inconveniences which might well alarm even a bold politician. It was necessary to purchase concession by concession. The Commons, by a hundred and ninety-two votes to a hundred and fifty, agreed to the amendment on which the Lords had, during four years, so obstinately insisted, and the Lords, in return, immediately passed the recoinage bill without any amendment. There had been much contention as to the time at which the new system of procedure in cases of high treason should come into operation, and the bill had once been lost in consequence of a dispute on this point. Many persons were of opinion that the change ought not to take place till the close of the war. It was notorious, they said, that the foreign enemy was abetted by too many traitors at home and at such a time the severity of the laws which protected the commonwealth against the machinations of bad citizens ought not to be relaxed. It was at last determined that the new regulations sh should take effect on the 25th of March, the first day according to the old calendar of the year 1696. On the 21st of January the recoinage bill and the bill for regulating trials in cases of high treason received the royal assent. On the following day the commons repaired to Kensington on an errand by no means agreeable either to themselves or to the king. They were, as a body, fully resolved to support him at whatever cost and whatever hazard against every foreign and domestic foe but they were, as indeed every assembly of five hundred and thirteen English gentlemen that could by any process have been brought together must have been, jealous of the favour which he showed to the friends of his youth. He had set his heart on placing the house of Bentinck on a level in wealth and splendour with the houses of Howard and Seymour, of Russell and Cavendish. Some of the fairest hereditary domains of the crown had been granted to Portland, not without murmuring on the part both of Whigs and Tories. Nothing had been done, it is true, which was not in conformity with the letter of the law and with a long series of precedents. Every English sovereign had from time immemorial considered the lands to which he had succeeded in virtue of his office, as his private property. Every family that had been great in England, from the De Veres down to the Hydes, had been enriched by royal deeds of gift. Charles the Second had carved ducal estates for his bastards out of his hereditary domain. Nor did the Bill of Rights contain a word which could be construed to mean that the King was not at perfect liberty to alienate any part of the estates of the crown. At first, therefore, William's liberality to his countrymen, though it caused much discontent, called forth no remonstrance from the Parliament. But he at length went too far. In 1695 he ordered the Lords of the Treasury to make out a warrant granting to Portland a magnificent estate in Denbyshire. This estate was said to be worth more than a hundred thousand pounds. 
the annual income therefore can hardly have been less than six thousand pounds and the annual rent which was reserved to the crown was only six and eightpence this however was not the worst with the property were inseparably connected extensive royalties which the people of north wales could not patiently see in the hands of any subject more than a century before elizabeth had bestowed a part of the same territory on her favourite leicester on that occasion the population of denbyshire had risen in arms and after much tumult and several executions leicester had thought it advisable to resign his mistress's gift back to her the opposition to portland was less violent but not less effective some of the chief gentlemen of the principality made strong representations to the ministers through whose offices the warrant had to pass and at length brought the subject under the consideration of the lower house an address was unanimously voted requesting the king to stop the grant portland begged that he might not be the cause of a dispute between his master and the parliament and the king though much mortified yielded to the general wish of the nation this unfortunate affair though it terminated without an open quarrel left much sore feeling the king was angry with the commons and still more angry with the whig ministers who had not ventured to defend his grant the loyal affection which the parliament had testified to him during the first days of the session and he was almost as unpopular as he had ever been when an event took place which suddenly brought back to him the hearts of millions and made him for a time as much the idol of the nation as he had been at the end of sixteen eighty eight the plan of assassination which had been formed in the preceding spring had been given up in consequence of william's departure for the continent the plan of insurrection which had been formed in the summer had been given up for want of help from france but before the end of the autumn both plans were resumed william had returned to england and the possibility of getting rid of him by a lucky shot or stab was again seriously discussed the french troops had gone into winter quarters and the force which charnock had in vain demanded while war was raging round namur might now be spared without inconvenience now therefore a plot was laid more formidable than any that had yet threatened the throne and the life of william or rather as has more than once happened in our history two plots were laid one within the other the object of the greater plot was an open insurrection an insurrection which was to be supported by a foreign army in this plot almost all the jacobites of note were more or less concerned some laid in arms some brought horses some made lists of the servants and tenants in whom they could place firm reliance the less warlike members of the party could at least take off bumpers to the king over the water and intimate by significant shrugs and whispers that he would not be over the water long it was universally remarked that the malcontents looked wiser than usual when they were sober and bragged more loudly than usual when they were drunk to the smaller plot of which the object was the murder of william only a few select traitors were privy each of these plots was under the direction of a leader specially sent from saint germain the more honourable mission was entrusted to berwick he was charged to communicate with the jacobite nobility and gentry to ascertain what force they could bring into the field and to fix a time for the rising he was authorized to assure them 
that the French government was collecting troops and transports at Calais, and that, as soon as it was known there that a rebellion had broken out in England, his father would embark with twelve thousand veteran soldiers, and would be among them in a few hours. A more hazardous part was assigned to an emissary of lower rank, but of great address, activity, and courage. This was Sir George Barclay, a Scotch gentleman who had served with credit under Dundee, and who, when the war in the Highlands had ended, had retired to Saint-Germain. Barclay was called into the royal closet, and received his orders from the royal lips. He was directed to steal across the channel, and to repair to London. He was told that a few select officers and soldiers should speedily follow him by twos and threes. That they might have no difficulty in finding him, he was to walk on Mondays and Thursdays in the piazza of Covent Garden after nightfall, with a white handkerchief hanging from his coat pocket. He was furnished with a considerable sum of money, and with a commission which was not only signed, but written from beginning to end by James himself. This commission authorized the bearer to do from time to time such acts of hostility against the Prince of Orange and that Prince's adherents as should most conduce to the service of the King. What explanation of these very comprehensive words was orally given by James, we are not informed. Lest Barclay's absence from Saint-Germain should cause any suspicion, it was given out that his loose way of life had made it necessary for him to put himself under the care of a surgeon at Paris. He set out with eight hundred pounds in his portmanteau, hastened to the coast, and embarked on board of a privateer which was employed by the Jacobites as a regular packet-boat between France and England. This vessel conveyed him to a desolate spot in Romney Marsh. About half a mile from the landing-place, a smuggler named Hunt lived on a dreary and unwholesome fen, where he had no neighbours but a few rude shepherds. His dwelling was singularly well situated for a contraband traffic in French wares. Cargoes of Lyon silk and Valenciennes lace sufficient to load thirty pack-horses had repeatedly been landed in that dismal solitude without attracting notice. But, since the revolution, Hunt had discovered that of all cargoes, a cargo of traitors paid best. His lonely abode became the resort of men of high consideration, earls and barons, knights and doctors of divinity. Some of them lodged many days under his roof while waiting for a passage. A clandestine post was established between his house and London. The couriers were constantly going and returning. They performed their journeys up and down on foot, but they appeared to be gentlemen, and it was whispered that one of them was the son of a titled man. The letters from Saint-Germain were few and small. Those directed to Saint-Germain were numerous and bulky. They were made up like parcels of millinery, and were buried in the morass till they were called for by the privateer. Here Barclay landed in January 1696, and hence he took the road to London. He was followed a few days later by a tall youth who concealed his name, but who produced credentials of the highest authority. The youth, too, proceeded to London. Hunt afterwards discovered that his humble roof had had the honour of sheltering the Duke of Berwick. The part which Barclay had to perform was difficult and hazardous, and he omitted no precaution. He had been little in London, and his face was consequently unknown to the agents of the government. Nevertheless, he had several lodgings. 
he disguised himself so well that his oldest friends would not have known him by broad daylight, and yet he seldom ventured into the streets except in the dark. His chief agent was a monk, who under several names heard confessions and said masses at the risk of his neck. This man intimated to some of the zealots with whom he consorted a special agent of the royal family was to be spoken with in Covent Garden on certain nights at a certain hour and might be known by certain signs. In this way Barclay became acquainted with several men fit for his purpose. The first persons to whom he fully opened himself were Charnock and Parkins. He talked with them about the plot which they and some of their friends had formed in the preceding spring against the life of William. Both Charnock and Parkins declared that the scheme might easily be executed, that there was no want of resolute hearts among the royalists, and that all that was wanting was some sign of his majesty's approbation. Then Barclay produced his commission. He showed his two accomplices that James had expressly commanded all good Englishmen not only to rise in arms, not only to make war on the usurping government, not only to seize forts and towns, but also to do from time to time such other acts of hostility against the Prince of Orange as might be for the royal service. These words, Barclay said, plainly authorized an attack on the Prince's person. Charnock and Parkins were satisfied. How, in truth, was it possible for them to doubt that James's confidential agent correctly construed James's expressions? Nay, how was it possible for them to understand the large words of the commission in any sense but one, even if Barclay had not been there to act as commentator? If, indeed, the subject had never been brought under James's consideration, it might well be thought that those words had dropped from his pen without any definite meaning, but he had been repeatedly apprised that some of his friends in England meditated a deed of blood, and that they were waiting only for his approbation. They had importuned him to speak one word to give one sign. He had long kept silence, and now that he had broken silence, he merely told them to do whatever might be beneficial to himself and prejudicial to the usurper. They had his authority as plainly given as they could reasonably expect to have it given in such a case. All that remained was to find a sufficient number of courageous and trustworthy assistants, to provide horses and weapons, and to fix the hour and the place of the slaughter. Forty or fifty men, it was thought, would be sufficient. Those troopers of James's guard, who had already followed Barclay across the channel, made up nearly half that number. James had himself seen some of these men before their departure from Saint-Germain, had given them money for their journey, had told them by what name each of them was to pass in England, had commanded them to act as though they should be directed by Barclay, and had informed them where Barclay was to be found and by what tokens he was to be known. They were ordered to depart in small parties and to assign different reasons for going. Some were ill, some were weary of the service. Castles, one of the most noisy and profane among them, announced that since he could not get military promotion, he should enter at the Scotch College and study for a learned profession. Under such pretexts, about twenty picked men left the palace of James, made their way by Romney Marsh to London, and found their captain walking in the dim lamplight of the piazza with the handkerchief hanging from his pocket. 
One of these men was Ambrose Rockwood, who held the rank of brigadier, and who had a high reputation for courage and honour. Another was Major John Bernardi, an adventurer of Genoese extraction, whose name has derived a melancholy celebrity from a punishment so strangely prolonged that it at length shocked a generation which could not remember his crime. It was in these adventurers from France that Barclay placed his chief trust. In a moment of elation, he once called them his janissaries, and expressed a hope that they would get him the George and Garter. But twenty more assassins at least were wanted, the conspirators probably expected valuable help from Sir John Friend, who had received a colonel's commission signed by James, and had been most active in enlisting men and providing arms against the day when the French should appear on the coast of Kent. The design was imparted to him, but he thought it so rash and so likely to bring reproach and disaster on the good cause that he would lend no assistance to his friends, though he kept their secret religiously. Charnock undertook to find eight brave and trusty fellows. He communicated the design to Porter, not with Barclay's entire approbation, for Barclay appears to have thought that a tavern brawler, who had recently been in prison for swaggering drunk about the streets, and huzzaing in honour of the Prince of Wales, was hardly to be trusted with a secret of such fearful import. Porter entered into the plot with enthusiasm, and promised to bring in others who would be useful. Among those whose help he engaged was his servant, Thomas Keyes. Keyes was a far more formidable conspirator than might have been expected from his station in life. The household troops generally were devoted to William, but there was a taint of disaffection among the Blues. The chief conspirators had already been tampering with some Roman Catholics who were in that regiment, and Keyes was excellently qualified to bear a part in this work, for he had formerly been trumpeter of the corps, and though he had quitted the service, he still kept up an acquaintance with some of the old soldiers in whose company he had lived at free quarter on the Somersetshire farmers after the Battle of Sedgemoor. End of section 11all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 21, Section 12. Parkins, who was old and gouty, could not himself take a share in the work of death, but he employed himself in providing horses, saddles, and weapons for his younger and more active accomplices. In this department of business he was assisted by Charles Cranburn, a person who had long acted as a broker between Jacobite plotters and people who dealt in cutlery and firearms. Special orders were given by Barclay that the swords should be made rather for stabbing than for slashing. Barclay himself enlisted Edward Lowick, who had been a major in the Irish army, and who had, since the capitulation of Limerick, been living obscurely in London. The monk who had been Barclay's first confidant recommended two busy papists, Richard Fisher and Christopher Knightley, and this recommendation was thought sufficient. Knightley drew in Edward King, a Roman Catholic gentleman of hot and restless temper, and King procured the assistance of a French gambler and bully named De La Rue. Meanwhile the heads of the conspiracy held frequent meetings at 
treason taverns for the purpose of settling a plan of operations several schemes were proposed applauded and on full consideration abandoned at one time it was thought that an attack on kensington house at dead of night might probably be successful the outer wall might easily be scaled if once forty armed men were in the garden the palace would soon be stormed or set on fire some were of opinion that it would be best to strike the blow on a sunday as william went from kensington to attend divine service at the chapel of st james palace the murderers might assemble near the spot where apsley house and hamilton place now stand just as the royal coach passed out of hyde park and was about to enter what has since been called the green park thirty of the conspirators well mounted might fall on the guards the guards were ordinarily only five and twenty they would be taken completely by surprise and probably half of them would be shot or cut down before they could strike a blow meanwhile ten or twelve resolute men on foot would stop the carriage by shooting the horses and would then without difficulty dispatch the king at last the preference was given to a plan originally sketched by fisher and put into shape by porter william was in the habit of going every saturday from kensington to hunt in richmond park there was then no bridge over the thames between london and kensington the king therefore went in a coach escorted by some of his bodyguards through turnham green to the river there he took boat crossed the water and found another coach and another set of guards ready to receive him on the surrey side the first coach and the first set of guards awaited his return on the northern bank the conspirators ascertained with great precision the whole order of these journeys and carefully examined the ground on both sides of the thames they thought that they should attack the king with more advantage on the middlesex than on the surrey bank and when he was returning than when he was going for when he was going he was often attended to the waterside by a great retinue of lords and gentlemen but on his return he had only his guards about him the place and time were fixed the place was to be a narrow and winding lane leading from the landing place on the north of the river to turnham green the spot may still be easily found the ground has since been drained by trenches but in the seventeenth century it was a quagmire through which the royal coach was with difficulty tugged at a foot's pace the time was to be the afternoon of saturday the fifteenth of february on that day the forty were to assemble in small parties at public houses near the green when the signal was given that the coach was approaching they were to take horse and repair to their posts as the cavalcade came up this lane charnock was to attack the guards in the rear rockwood on one flank porter on the other meanwhile barclay with eight trusty men was to stop the coach and to do the deed that no movement of the king might escape notice two orderlies were appointed to watch the palace one of these men a bold and active fleming named durant was especially charged to keep berkeley well informed the other whose business was to communicate with charnock was a ruffian named chambers who had served in the irish army had received a severe wound in the breast at the boyne and on account of that wound bore a savage personal hatred to william while Barclay was making all his arrangements for the assassination, Berwick was endeavouring to persuade the Jacobite aristocracy to rise in arms. But this was no easy task. Several consultations were held, and there was one great muster of the party under the pretence of a masquerade, 
for which tickets were distributed among the initiated at one guinea each. All ended, however, in talking, singing, and drinking. Many men of rank and fortune indeed declared that they would draw their swords for their rightful sovereign as soon as their rightful sovereign was in the island with the French army, and Berwick had been empowered to assure them that a French army should be sent as soon as they had drawn the sword. But between what they asked and what he was authorized to grant, there was a difference which admitted of no compromise. Lewis, situated as he was, would not risk ten or twelve thousand excellent soldiers on the mere faith of promises. Similar promises had been made in 1690, and yet when the fleet of Tourville had appeared on the coast of Devonshire, the western counties had risen as one man in defence of the government, and not a single malcontent had dared to utter a whisper in favour of the invaders. Similar promises had been made in 1692, and to the confidence which had been placed in those promises was to be attributed the great disaster of La Hogue. The French king would not be deceived a third time. He would gladly help the English royalists, but he must first see them help themselves. There was much reason in this, and there was reason also in what the Jacobites urged on the other side. If, they said, they were to rise, without a single disciplined regiment to back them, against a usurper supported by a regular army, they should all be cut to pieces before the news that they were up could reach Versailles. As Berwick could hold out no hope that there would be an invasion before there was an insurrection, and as his English friends were immovable in their determination that there should be no insurrection till there was an invasion, he had nothing more to do here, and became impatient to depart. He was the more impatient to depart, because the 15th of February drew near, for he was in constant communication with Barclay, and was perfectly apprised of all the details of the crime which was to be perpetrated on that day. He was generally considered as a man of sturdy and even ungracious integrity, but to such a degree had his sense of right and wrong been perverted by his zeal for the interests of his family, and by his respect for the lessons of his priests, that he did not, as he has himself ingeniously confessed, think that he lay under any obligation to dissuade the assassins from the execution of their purpose. He had indeed only one objection to their design, and that objection he kept to himself. It was simply this, that all who were concerned were very likely to be hanged. That, however, was their affair, and if they chose to run such a risk in the good cause, it was not his business to discourage them. His mission was quite distinct from theirs, he was not to act with them, and he had no inclination to suffer with them. He therefore hastened down to Romney Marsh and crossed to Calais. At Calais he found preparations making for a descent on Kent. Troops filled the town, transports filled the port, Boufflers had been ordered to repair thither from Flanders and to take the command. James himself was daily expected. In fact, he had already left Saint-Germain. Berwick, however, would not wait. He took the road to Paris, met his father at Clermont, and made a full report of the state of things in England. His embassy had failed. The royalist nobility and gentry seemed resolved not to rise till a French army was in the island. But there was still a hope. News would probably come within a few days that the usurper was no more, and such news would change the whole aspect of affairs. James determined to go on to Calais, 
and there to await the events of Barclay's plot. Berwick hastened to Versailles for the purpose of giving explanations to Lewis. What the nature of the explanations was we know from Berwick's own narrative. He plainly told the French king that a small band of loyal men would in a short time make an attempt on the life of the great enemy of France. The next courier might bring tidings of an event which would probably subvert the English government and dissolve the European coalition. It might have been thought that a prince who ostentatiously affected the character of a devout Christian and of a courteous knight would instantly have taken measures for conveying to his rival a caution which perhaps might still arrive in time and would have severely reprimanded the guests who had so grossly abused his hospitality. Such, however, was not the conduct of Lewis. Had he been asked to give his sanction to a murder, he would probably have refused with indignation. But he was not moved to indignation by learning that, without his sanction, a crime was likely to be committed which would be far more beneficial to his interests than ten such victories as that of Landon. He sent down orders to Calais that his fleet should be in readiness as might enable him to take advantage of the great crisis which he anticipated. At Calais James waited with still more impatience for the signal that his nephew was no more. That signal was to be given by a fire, of which the fuel was already prepared on the cliffs of Kent, and which would be visible across the straits. But a peculiar fate has, in our country, always attended such conspiracies as that of Barclay and Charnock. The English regard assassination, and have during some ages regarded it, with a loathing peculiar to themselves. So English, indeed, is this sentiment that it cannot even now be called Irish, and till a recent period it was not Scotch. In Ireland, to this day, the villain who shoots at his enemy from behind a hedge is too often protected from justice by public sympathy. In Scotland, plans of assassination were often during the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries, successfully executed, though known to a great number of persons. The murders of Beaton, of Rizzio, of Darnley, of Murray, of Sharp, are conspicuous instances. The royalists who murdered Lyle in Switzerland were Irishmen. The royalists who murdered Asham at Madrid were Irishmen. The royalists who murdered Doris Laus at The Hague were Scotchmen. In England, as soon as such a design ceases to be a secret hidden in the recesses of one gloomy and ulcerated heart, the risk of detection and failure becomes extreme. Felton and Bellingham reposed trust in no human being, and they were therefore able to accomplish their evil purposes. But Babington's conspiracy against Elizabeth, Fawkes's conspiracy against James, Gerard's conspiracy against Cromwell, the Rye House conspiracy, the Cato Street conspiracy, were all discovered, frustrated, and punished. In truth, such a conspiracy is here exposed to equal danger from the good and bad qualities of the conspirators. Scarcely any Englishman, not utterly destitute of conscience and honour, will engage in a plot for slaying an unsuspecting fellow creature, and a wretch who has neither conscience nor honour is likely to think much on the danger which he incurs by being true to his associates, and on the rewards which he may obtain by betraying them. There are, it is true, persons in whom religious or political fanaticism has destroyed all moral sensibility on one particular point, and yet has left that sensibility 
generally unimpaired. Such a person was Digby. He had no scruple about blowing king, lords, and commons into the air, yet to his accomplices he was religiously and chivalrously faithful. Nor could even the fear of the rack extort from him one word to their prejudice. But this union of depravity and heroism is very rare. The vast majority of men are either not vicious enough or not virtuous enough to be loyal and devoted members of treacherous and cruel confederacies, and if a single member should want either the necessary vice or the necessary virtue, the whole confederacy is in danger. To bring together in one body forty Englishmen, all hardened cutthroats, and yet all so upright and generous that neither the hope of opulence nor the dread of the gallows can tempt any one of them to be false to the rest, has hitherto been found, and will, it is to be hoped, always be found impossible. There were among Barclay's followers both men too bad and men too good to be trusted with a secret as this. The first whose heart failed him was Fisher. Even before the time and place of the crime had been fixed, he obtained an audience of Portland, and told that lord that a design was forming against the king's life. Some days later Fisher came again with more precise intelligence, but his character was not such as entitled him to much credit, and the knavery of Fuller, of Young, of Whitney, and of Taff, had made men of sense slow to believe stories of plots. Portland, therefore, though in general very easily alarmed where the safety of his master and friend was concerned, seems to have thought little about the matter. But on the evening of the 14th of February he received a visit from a person whose testimony he could not treat lightly. This was a Roman Catholic gentleman of known courage and honour, named Pendergrass. He had, on the preceding day, come up to town from Hampshire, in consequence of a pressing summons from Porter, who, dissolute and unprincipled as he was, had to Pendergrass been a most kind friend, indeed almost a father. In a Jacobite insurrection, Pendergrass would probably have been one of the foremost, but he learned with horror that he was expected to bear a part in a wicked and shameful deed. He found himself in one of those situations which most cruelly torture noble and sensitive natures. What was he to do? Was he to commit a murder? Was he to suffer a murder which he could prevent to be committed? Yet was he to betray one who, however culpable, had loaded him with benefits. Perhaps it might be possible to save William without harming Porter. Pendergrass determined to make the attempt. My lord, he said to Portland, as you value King William's life, do not let him hunt to-morrow. He is the enemy of my religion, yet my religion constrains me to give him this caution but the names of the conspirators I am resolved to conceal. Some of them are my friends, one of them especially is my benefactor, and I will not betray them. Portland went instantly to the king, but the king received the intelligence very coolly, and seemed determined not to be frightened out of a good day's sport by such an idle story. Portland argued and implored in vain. He was at last forced to threaten that he would immediately make the whole matter public, unless His Majesty would consent to remain within doors during the next day, and this threat was successful. Saturday the 15th came. The forty were all ready to mount when they received intelligence from the orderlies who watched Kensington House that the king did not mean to hunt that morning. 
The fox, said Chambers with vindictive bitterness, keeps his earth. Then he opened his shirt, showed the great scar in his breast, and vowed revenge on William. The first thought of the conspirators was that their design had been detected, but they were soon reassured. It was given out that the weather had kept the king at home, and indeed the day was cold and stormy. There was no sign of agitation at the palace, no extraordinary precaution was taken, no arrest was made, no ominous whisper was heard at the coffee-houses. The delay was vexatious, but Saturday the 22nd would do as well. But before Saturday the 22nd arrived, a third informer, De La Rue, had presented himself at the palace. His way of life did not entitle him to much respect, but his story agreed so exactly with what had been said by Fisher and Pendergrass that even William began to believe that there was real danger. Very late in the evening of Friday the 21st, Pendergrass, who had as yet disclosed much less than either of the other informers, but whose single word was worth much more than their joint oath, was sent for to the royal closet. The faithful Portland and the gallant Cuts were the only persons who witnessed the singular interview between the King and his generous enemy. William, with courtesy and animation which he rarely showed, but which he never showed without making a deep impression, urged Pendergrass to speak out. "'You are a man of true probity and honour. I am deeply obliged to you. But you must feel that the same considerations which have induced you to tell us so much ought to induce you to tell us something more. The cautions which you have as yet given can only make me suspect everybody that comes near me. They are sufficient to embitter my life, but not sufficient to preserve it. You must let me know the names of these men. During more than half an hour the king continued to entreat, and Pendergrass to refuse. At last Pendergrass said that he would give the information which was required, if he could be assured that it would be used only for the prevention of the crime, and not for the destruction of the criminals. "'I give you my word of honour, said William, that your evidence shall not be used against any person without your own free consent. It was long past midnight when Pendergrass wrote down the names of the chief conspirators. While these things were passing at Kensington, a large party of the assassins were revelling at a Jacobite tavern in Maiden Lane. Here they received their final orders for the morrow. Tomorrow or never, said King. Tomorrow, boys, cried Castles with a curse we shall have the plunder of the field. The morrow came, all was ready, the horses were saddled, the pistols were loaded, the swords were sharpened, the orderlies were on the alert, they early sent intelligence from the palace that the king was certainly going a-hunting. All the usual preparations had been made. A party of guards had been sent round by Kingston Bridge to Richmond, the royal coaches, each with six horses, had gone from the stables at Charing Cross to Kensington. The chief murderers assembled in high glee at Porter's lodgings. Pendergrast, who by the king's command appeared among them, was greeted with ferocious mirth. Pendergrass, said Porter, you are named one of the eight who are to do his business. I have a musketoon for you that will carry eight balls. Mr. Pendergrass, said King, pray do not be afraid of smashing the glass windows. From Porter's lodgings the party adjourned to the blue posts in Spring Gardens, where they meant to take some refreshment before they started for Turnham Green. They were at table when a message came from an orderly that the King had changed his mind 
and would not hunt, and scarcely had they recovered from their first surprise at this ominous news, when Keyes, who had been out scouting among his old comrades, arrived with news more ominous still. The coaches have returned to Charing Cross. The guards that were sent round to Richmond have just come back to Kensington at full gallop, the flanks of the horses all white with foam. I have had a word with one of the blues. He told me that strange things are muttered. Then the countenances of the assassins fell, and their hearts died within them. Porter made a feeble attempt to disguise his uneasiness. He took up an orange and squeezed it. What cannot be done one day may be done another. Come, gentlemen, before we part, let us have one glass to the squeezing of the rotten orange. The squeezing of the rotten orange was drunk, and the company dispersed. A few hours elapsed before all the conspirators abandoned all hope. Some of them derived comfort from a report that the king had taken physic, and that this was his only reason for not going to Richmond. If it were so, the blow might still be struck. Two Saturdays had been unpropitious, but Sunday was at hand. One of the plans which had formerly been discussed and abandoned might be resumed. The usurper might be set upon at Hyde Park Corner, on his way to his chapel. Charnock was ready for any enterprise, however desperate. If the hunt was up, it was better to die biting and scratching to the last than to be worried without resistance or revenge. He assembled some of his accomplices at one of the numerous houses at which he had lodgings, and plied there hard with healths to the king, to the queen, to the prince, and to the grand monarch, as they called Lewis. But the terror and dejection of the gang were beyond the power of wine, and so many had stolen away that those who were left could effect nothing. In the course of the afternoon it was known that the guards had been doubled at the palace, and soon after nightfall messengers from the Secretary of State's office were hurrying to and fro with torches through the streets, accompanied by files and musketeers. Before the dawn of Sunday, Charnock was in custody. A little later, Rockwood and Bernardi were found in bed at a Jacobite alehouse on Tower Hill. Seventeen more traitors were seized before noon, and three of the Blues were put under arrest. That morning a council was held, and as soon as it rose an express was sent off to call home some regiments from Flanders. Dorset set out for Sussex, of which he was Lord Lieutenant. Romney, who was warden of the Cinque Ports, started for the coast of Kent, and Russell hastened down the Thames to take command of the fleet. In the evening the council sat again. Some of the prisoners were examined and committed. The Lord Mayor was in attendance, was informed of what had been discovered, and was specially charged to look well to the peace of the capital. On Monday morning all the train bands of the city were under arms. The King went in state to the House of Lords, sent for the Commons, and from the throne, told the Parliament that, but for the protection of a gracious providence, he should at that moment have been a corpse, and the kingdom would have been invaded by a French army. The danger of invasion, he added, was still great, but he had already given such orders as would, he hoped, suffice for the protection of the realm. Some traitors were in custody, warrants were out against others, he should do his part in this emergency, and he relied on the houses to do theirs. The houses instantly voted a joint address, in which they thankfully acknowledged the divine goodness which had preserved him to his people, and implored him to take more than ordinary care of his person, 
they concluded by exhorting him to seize and secure all persons whom he regarded as dangerous. End of section 12of chapter 21 of a history of england this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org history of england by thomas babington macaulay chapter 21 section 13 on the same day two important bills were brought into the commons by one the habeas corpus act was suspended the other provided that the parliament should not be dissolved by the death of william sir roland gwynne an honest country gentleman made a motion of which he did not at all foresee the important consequences he proposed that the members should enter into an association for the defence of their sovereign and their country montague who of all men was the quickest at taking and improving a hint saw how much such an association would strengthen the government and the whig party an instrument was immediately drawn up by which the representatives of the people each for himself solemnly recognized william as rightful and lawful king and bound themselves to stand by him and by each other against james and james's adherents lastly they vowed that if his majesty's life should be shortened by violence they would avenge him signally on his murderers and would with one heart strenuously support the order of succession settled by the bill of rights it was ordered that the house should be called over the next morning the attendance was consequently great the association engrossed on parchment was on the table and the members went up county by county to sign their names the king's speech the joint address of both houses the association framed by the commons and a proclamation containing a list of the conspirators and offering a reward of a thousand pounds for the apprehension of any one of them were soon cried in all the streets of the capital and carried out by all the post bags wherever the news came it raised the whole country those two hateful words assassination and invasion acted like a spell no impressment was necessary. The seamen came forth from their hiding places by thousands to man the fleet. Only three days after the king had appealed to the nation, Russell sailed out of the Thames with one great squadron. Another was ready for action at Spithead. The militia of all the maritime counties from the Wash to the Land's End was under arms. For persons accused of offences merely political, there was generally much sympathy. But Barclay's assassins were hunted like wolves by the whole population. The abhorrence which the English have, through many generations, felt for domiciliary visits and for all those impediments which the police of continental states throws in the way of travellers, was for a time suspended. The gates of the city of London were kept many hours closed, while a strict search was made within. The magistrates of almost every walled town in the kingdom followed the example of the capital. On every highway parties of armed men were posted with orders to stop passengers of suspicious appearance. During a few days it was hardly possible to perform a journey without a passport, or to procure post-horses without the authority of a justice of the peace. Nor was any voice raised against these precautions. The common people indeed were, if possible, more eager than the public functionaries to bring the traitors to justice. 
This eagerness may perhaps in part be ascribed to the great rewards promised by the royal proclamation. The hatred which every good Protestant felt for popish cutthroats was not a little strengthened by the songs in which the street poets celebrated the lucky hackney coachman who had caught his traitor, had received his thousand pounds, and had set up as a gentleman. The zeal of the populace could in some places hardly be kept within the limits of the law. At the country seat of Parkins in Warwickshire, arms and accoutrements sufficient to equip a troop of cavalry were found. As soon as this was known, a furious mob assembled, pulled down the house, and laid the gardens utterly waste. Parkins himself was tracked to a garret in the temple. Porter and Keyes, who had fled into Surrey, were pursued by the hue and cry, stopped by the country people near Leatherhead, and after some show of resistance, secured and sent to prison. Friend was found hidden in the house of a Quaker. Knightley was caught in the dress of a fine lady, and recognized in spite of his patches and paint. In a few days all the chief conspirators were in custody except Barclay, who succeeded in making his escape to France. At the same time some notorious malcontents were arrested, and were detained for a time on suspicion. Old Roger Lestrange, now in his eightieth year, was taken up. Ferguson was found hidden under a bed in Gray's Inn Lane, and was, to the general joy, locked up in Newgate. Meanwhile a special commission was issued for the trial of the traitors. There was no want of evidence, for the conspirators who had been seized Ten or twelve were ready to save themselves by bearing witness against their associates. None had been deeper in guilt, and none shrank with more abject terror from death than Porter. The government consented to spare him, and thus obtained not only his evidence, but the much more respectable evidence of Pendergrass. Pendergrass was in no danger. He had committed no offence. His character was fair, and his testimony would have far greater weight with a jury than the testimony of a crowd of approvers swearing for their necks. But he had the royal word of honour that he should not be a witness without his own consent, and he was fully determined not to be a witness unless he were assured of Porter's safety. Porter was now safe, and Pendergrass had no longer any scruple about relating the whole truth. Charnock, King, and Keyes were set first to the bar. The chiefs of the three courts of common law and several other judges were on the bench, and among the audience were many members of both houses of Parliament. It was the 11th of March. A new act which regulated the procedure in cases of high treason was not to come into forth till the 25th. The culprits urged that as the legislation had, by passing that act, recognized the justice of allowing them to see their indictment and to avail themselves of the assistance of an advocate, the tribunal ought either to grant them what the highest authority had declared to be a reasonable indulgence, or to defer the trial for a fortnight. The judges, however, would consent to no delay. They have therefore been accused by later writers of using the mere letter of the law in order to destroy men who, if that law had been construed according to its spirit, might have had some chance of escape. This accusation is unjust. The judges undoubtedly carried the real intention of the legislature into effect, and, for whatever injustice was committed, the legislature, and not the judges, ought to be held accountable. 
The words, 25th of March, had not slipped into the act by mere inadvertence. All parties in Parliament had long been agreed as to the principle of the new regulations. The only matter about which there was any dispute was the time at which those regulations should take effect. After debates extending through several sessions, after repeated divisions with various results, a compromise had been made, and it was surely not for the courts to alter the terms of that compromise. It may indeed be confidently affirmed that if the House had foreseen the assassination plot, they would have fixed not an earlier but a later day for the commencement of the new system. Undoubtedly the Parliament, and especially the Whig Party, deserved serious blame, for if the old rules of procedure gave no unfair advantage to the Crown, there was no reason for altering them, and if, as was generally admitted, they did give an unfair advantage to the Crown, and that against a defendant on trial for his life, they ought not to have been suffered to continue in force a single day. But no blame is due to the tribunals for not acting in direct opposition both to the letter and to the spirit of the law. The government might indeed have postponed the trials till the new act came into force, and it would have been wise as well as right to do so, for the prisoners would have gained nothing by the delay. The case against them was one on which all the ingenuity of the inns of court could have made no impression. Porter, Pendergrass, Delarue, and others gave evidence which admitted of no answer. Charnock said the very little that he had to say with readiness and presence of mind. The jury found all the defendants guilty. It is not much to the honour of that age that the announcement of the verdict was received with loud huzzas by the crowd which surrounded the courthouse. Those huzzas were renewed when the three unhappy men, having heard their doom, were brought forth under a guard. Charnock had hitherto shown no signs of flinching, but when he was again in his cell his fortitude gave way. He begged hard for mercy. He would be content, he said, to pass the rest of his days in an easy confinement. He asked only for his life. In return for his life he promised to discover all that he knew of the schemes of the Jacobites against the government. If it should appear that he prevaricated, or that he suppressed anything, he was willing to undergo the utmost rigour of the law. This offer produced much excitement, and some difference of opinion among the councillors of William. But the king decided, as in such cases he seldom failed to decide, wisely and magnanimously. He saw that the discovery of the assassination plot had changed the whole position of affairs. His throne, lately tottering, was fixed on an immovable basis. His popularity had risen impetuously to as great a height as when he was on his march from Torbay to London. Many who had been out of humour with his administration and who had, in their spleen, held some communication with Saint-Germain, were shocked to find that they had been, in some sense, leagued with murderers. He would not drive such persons to despair. He would not even put them to the blush. Not only should they not be punished, they should not undergo the humiliation of being pardoned. He would not know that they had offended. Charnock was left to his fate. When he found that he had no chance of being received as a deserter, he assumed the dignity of a martyr, and played his part resolutely to the close. That he might bid farewell to the world with a better grace, he ordered a fine new coat to be hanged in, 
and was very particular on his last day about the powdering and curling of his wig. Just before he was turned off, he delivered to the sheriffs a paper in which he avowed that he had conspired against the life of the Prince of Orange, but solemnly denied that James had given any commission authorizing assassination. The denial was doubtless literally correct, but Charnock did not deny, and assuredly could not with truth have denied, that he had seen a commission written and signed by James, and containing words which might without any violence be construed, and which were, by all to whom they were shown, actually construed, to authorise the murderous ambuscade of Turnham Green. Indeed, Charnock, in another paper which is still in existence, but has never been printed, held very different language. He plainly said that, for reasons too obvious to be mentioned, he could not tell the whole truth in the paper which he had delivered to the sheriffs. He acknowledged that the plot in which he had been engaged seemed, even to many loyal subjects, highly criminal. They called him assassin and murderer, yet what had he done more than had been done by Mucius Scaevola? Nay, what had he done more than had been done by everybody who bore arms against the Prince of Orange? If an array of twenty thousand men had suddenly landed in England and surprised the usurper, this would have been called legitimate war. Did the difference between war and assassination depend merely on the number of persons engaged? What then was the smallest number which could lawfully surprise an enemy? Was it five thousand, or a thousand, or a hundred? Jonathan and his armour-bearer were only two, yet they made a great slaughter of the Philistines. Was that assassination? It cannot, said Charnock, be the mere act, it must be the cause that makes killing assassination. It followed that it was not assassination to kill one, and here the dying man gave a loose to all his hatred who had declared a war of extermination against loyal subjects, who hung, drew, and quartered every man who stood up for the right, and who had laid waste England to enrich the Dutch. Charnock admitted that his enterprise would have been unjustifiable if it had not been authorized by James, but he maintained that it had been authorized not indeed expressly, but by implication. His Majesty had indeed formerly prohibited similar attempts, but had prohibited them not as in themselves criminal, but merely as inexpedient at this or that conjuncture of affairs. The prohibition might therefore reasonably be considered as withdrawn. His Majesty's faithful subjects had then only to look to the words of his commission, and those words, beyond all doubt, fully warranted an attack on the person of the usurper. King and Keys suffered with Charnock. King behaved with firmness and decency. He acknowledged his crime, and said that he repented of it. He thought it due to the church of which he was a member and on which his conduct had brought reproach, to declare that he had been misled, not by any casuistry about tyrannicide, but merely by the violence of his own evil passions. Poor Keyes was in an agony of terror. His tears and lamentations moved the pity of some of the spectators. It was said at the time and it has often since been repeated that a servant drawn into crime by a master was a proper object of royal clemency. But those who have blamed the severity with which Keyes was treated 
have altogether omitted to notice the important circumstance which distinguished his case from that of every other conspirator. He had been one of the blues. He had kept up to the last an intercourse with his old comrades. On the very day fixed for the murder, he had contrived to mingle with them and to pick up intelligence from them. The regiment had been so deeply infected with disloyalty that it had been found necessary to confine some men and to dismiss many more. Surely, if any example was to be made, it was proper to make an example of the agent by whose instrumentality the men who meant to shoot the king communicated with the men whose business was to guard him. Friend was tried next. His crime was not of so black a dye as that of the three conspirators who had just suffered. He had indeed invited foreign enemies to invade the realm, and had made preparations for joining them. But though he had been privy to the design of assassination, he had not been a party to it. His large fortune, however, and the use which he was well known to have made of it, marked him out as a fit object for punishment. He, like Charnock, asked for counsel, and, like Charnock, asked in vain. The judges could not relax the law, and the Attorney-General would not postpone the trial. The proceedings of that day furnish a strong argument in favour of the act from the benefit of which friend was excluded. It is impossible to read them over at this distance of time without feeling compassion for a silly, ill-educated man unnerved by extreme danger and opposed to cool, astute, and experienced antagonists. Charnock had defended himself and those who were tried with him as well as any professional advocate could have done. But poor friend was as helpless as a child. He could do little more than exclaim that he was a Protestant, and that the witnesses against him were Papists, who had dispensations from their priests for perjury, and who believed that to swear away the lives of heretics was a meritorious work. He was so grossly ignorant of law and history as to imagine that the statute of treasons passed in the reign of Edward the Third, at a time when there was only one religion in Western Europe, contained a clause providing that no papist should be a witness, and actually forced the clerk of the court to read the whole act from beginning to end. About his guilt it was impossible that there could be a doubt in any rational mind. He was convicted, and he would have been convicted if he had been allowed the privileges for which he asked. Parkins came next. He had been deeply concerned in the worst part of the plot, and was, in one respect, less excusable than any of his accomplices for they were all non-jurors, and he had taken the oaths to the existing government. He too insisted that he ought to be tried according to the provisions of the new act, but the counsel for the crown stood on their extreme right, and his request was denied. As he was a man of considerable abilities, and had been bred to the bar, he probably said for himself all that counsel could have said for him, and that all amounted to very little. He was found guilty and received sentence of death on the evening of the 24th of March, within six hours of the time when the law of which he had vainly demanded the benefit was to come into force. The execution of the two knights was eagerly expected by the population of London. The States-General were informed by their correspondent that of all sights, that in which the English most delighted was a hanging, and that of all hangings within the memory of the oldest man, 
that of friend and parkins excited the greatest interest the multitude had been incensed against friend by reports touching the exceeding badness of the beer which he brewed it was even rumoured that he had in his zeal for the jacobite cause poisoned all the casks which he had furnished to the navy an innumerable crowd accordingly assembled at tyburn scaffolding had been put up which formed an immense amphitheatre round the gallows on this scaffolding the wealthier spectators stood row above row and expectation was at the height when it was announced that the show was deferred the mob broke up in bad humour and not without many fights between those who had given money for their places and those who refused to return it the cause of this severe disappointment was a resolution suddenly passed by the commons a member had proposed that a committee be sent to the tower with authority to examine the prisoners and to hold out to them the hope that they might by a full and ingenuous confession obtain the intercession of the house the debate appears from the scanty information which has come down to us to have been a very curious one parties seem to have changed characters it might have been expected that the whigs would have been inexorably severe and that if there was any tenderness for the unhappy men that tenderness would have been found among the tories but in truth many of the whigs hoped that they might by sparing two criminals who had no power to do mischief be able to detect and destroy numerous criminals high in rank and office on the other hand every man who had ever had any dealings direct or indirect with saint germain or who took an interest in any person likely to have had such dealings looked forward with dread to the disclosures which the captives might under the strong terrors of death be induced to make seymour simply because he had gone further in treason than almost any other member of the house was louder than any other member of the house in exclaiming against all indulgence to his brother traitors would the commons usurp the most sacred prerogative of the crown it was for his majesty and not for them to judge whether lives justly forfeited could be without danger spared the whigs however carried their point a committee consisting of all the privy councillors in the house set off instantly for newgate friend and parkins were interrogated but to no purpose they had after sentence had been passed on them shown at first some symptoms of weakness but their courage had been fortified by the exhortations of non-juring divines who had been admitted to the prison the rumour was that parkins would have given way but for the entreaties of his daughter who adjured him to suffer like a man for the good cause the criminals acknowledged that they had done the acts of which they had been convicted but with a resolution which is the more respectable because it seems to have sprung not from constitutional hardihood but from sentiments of honour and religion refused to say anything which could compromise others in a few hours the crowd again assembled at tyburn and this time the sightseers were not defrauded of their amusement they saw indeed one sight which if they had not expected and which produced a greater sensation than the execution itself jeremy collier and two other non-juring divines of less celebrity named cook and snat had attended the prisoners in newgate and were in the cart under the gallows when the prayers were over and just before the hangman did his office the three schismatical priests stood up and laid their hands on the heads of the dying men 
who continued to kneel. Collier pronounced a form of absolution taken from the service for the visitation of the sick, and his brethren exclaimed, Amen. The ceremony raised a great outcry, and the outcry became louder when, a few hours after the execution, the papers delivered by the two traitors to the sheriffs were made public. It had been supposed that Parkins, at least, would express some repentance for the crime which had brought him to the gallows. Indeed he had, before the Committee of the Commons, owned that the assassination plot could not be justified. But in his last declaration he avowed his share in that plot, not only without a word indicating remorse, but with something which resembled exultation. Was this a man to be absolved by Christian divines, absolved before the eyes of tens of thousands, absolved with rites evidently intended to attract public attention, with rites of which there was no trace in the Book of Common Prayer or in the practice of the Church of England? In journals, pamphlets and broadsides, the insolence of the three levits, as they were called, were sharply reprehended. Warrants were soon out. Cook and Snat were taken and imprisoned. But Collier was able to conceal himself, and by the help of one of the presses which were at the service of his party, sent forth from his hiding-place a defence of his conduct. He declared that he abhorred assassination as much as any of those who railed against him, and his general character warrants us in believing that this declaration was perfectly sincere. But the rash act into which he had been hurried by party spirit furnished his adversaries with very plausible reasons for questioning his sincerity. A crowd of answers to his defence appeared. Preeminent among them in importance was a solemn manifesto signed by the two archbishops and by all the bishops who were then in London, twelve in number. Even Crewe of Durham and Spratt of Rochester set their names to this document. They condemned the proceedings of the three non-juring divines as in form irregular and in substance impious. To remit the sins of impenitent sinners was a profane abuse of the power which Christ had delegated to his ministers. It was not denied that Parkins had planned an assassination. It was not pretended that he had professed any repentance for planning an assassination. The plain inference was that the divines who absolved him did not think it sinful to assassinate King William. Collier rejoined, but though a pugnacious controversialist, he on this occasion shrank from close conflict, and made his escape as well as he could under a cloud of quotations from Tertullian, Cyprian, and Jerome, Albus Bynaeus and Hammond, the Council of Carthage, and the Council of Toledo. The public feeling was strongly against the three absolvers. The government, however, wisely determined not to confer on them the honour of martyrdom. A bill was found against them by the grand jury of Middlesex, but they were not brought to trial. Cook and Snat were set at liberty after a short detention, and Collier would have been treated with equal lenity if he would have consented to put in bail, but he was determined to do no act which could be construed into a recognition of the usurping government. He was therefore outlawed, and when he died, more than thirty years later, his outlawry had not been reversed. Parkins was the last Englishman who was tried for high treason under the old system of procedure. The first who was tried under the new system was Rockwood. He was defended by Sir Bartholomew Shower, 
who in the preceding reign had made himself unenviably conspicuous as a servile and cruel sycophant, who had obtained from James the recordership of London when Holt honourably resigned it, and who had, as recorder, sent soldiers to the gibbet for breaches of military discipline. By his servile cruelty he had earned the nickname of the Manhunter. Shower deserved, if any offender deserved, to be accepted from the act of indemnity, and left to the utmost rigour of those laws which he had so shamelessly perverted. But he had been saved by the clemency of William, and had requited that clemency by pertinacious and malignant opposition. It was doubtless on account of Shower's known leaning towards Jacobitism that he was employed on this occasion. He raised some technical objections which the court overruled. On the merits of the case he could make no defence. The jury returned a verdict of guilty. Cranbourne and Lowick were then tried and convicted. They suffered with Rookwood, and there the executions stopped. End of section 13of chapter 21 of a history of england this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org history of england by thomas babington macaulay chapter 21 section 14 the temper of the nation was such that the government might have shed much more blood without incurring the reproach of cruelty. The feeling which had been called forth by the discovery of the plot continued during several weeks to increase day by day. Of that feeling the able men who were at the head of the Whig party made a singularly skilful use. They saw that the public enthusiasm, if left without guidance, would exhaust itself in huzzas, healths, and bonfires, but might, if wisely guided, be the means of producing a great and lasting effect. The association into which the Commons had entered while the King's speech was still in their ears furnished the means of combining four-fifths of the nation in one vast club for the defence of the order of succession with which were inseparably combined the dearest liberties of the English people, and of establishing a test which would distinguish those who were zealous for that order of succession from those who sullenly and reluctantly acquiesced in it. Of the five hundred and thirty members of the lower house, about four hundred and twenty voluntarily subscribed the instrument which recognized William as rightful and lawful King of England. It was moved in the upper house that the same form should be adopted, but objections were raised by the Tories. Nottingham, ever conscientious, honourable, and narrow-minded, declared that he could not assent to the words rightful and lawful. He still held, as he had held from the first, that a prince who had taken the crown, not by birthright but by the gift of the convention, could not properly be so described. William was doubtless king in fact, and as king in fact was entitled to the obedience of Christians. No man, said Nottingham, has served or will serve his majesty more faithfully than I, but to this document I cannot set my hand. Rochester and Normanby held similar language. Monmouth, in a speech of two hours and a half, earnestly exhorted the Lords to agree with the Commons. Burnet was vehement on the same side. Wharton, whose father had lately died, and who was now Lord Wharton, 
appeared in the foremost rank of the Whig peers, but no man distinguished himself more in the debate than one whose life, both public and private, had been one long series of faults and disasters. The incestuous lover of Henrietta Berkeley, the unfortunate lieutenant of Monmouth, he had recently ceased to be called by the tarnished name of Grey of Wark, and was now Earl of Tankerville. He spoke on that day with great force and eloquence for the words, rightful and lawful. Leeds, after expressing his regret that a question about a mere phrase should have produced dissension among noble persons who were all equally attached to the reigning sovereign, undertook the office of mediator. He proposed that their lordships, instead of recognizing William as rightful and lawful king, should declare that William had the right by law to the English crown, and that no other person had any right whatever to that crown. Strange to say, almost all the Tory peers were perfectly satisfied with what Leeds had suggested. Among the Whigs, there was some unwillingness to consent to a change which, slight as it was, might be thought to indicate a difference of opinion between the two houses on a subject of grave importance. But Devonshire and Portland declared themselves content. Their authority prevailed, and the alteration was made. How a rightful and lawful possessor is to be distinguished from a possessor who has the exclusive right by law, is a question which a Whig may, without any painful sense of shame, acknowledge to be beyond the reach of his faculties, and leave it to be discussed by high churchmen. Eighty-three peers immediately affixed their names to the amended form of association, and Rochester was among them. Nottingham, not yet quite satisfied, asked time for consideration. Beyond the walls of Parliament there was none of this verbal quibbling. The language of the House of Commons was adopted by the whole country. The City of London led the way. Within thirty-six hours after the association had been published under the director of the Speaker, it was subscribed by the Lord Mayor, by the Aldermen, and by almost all the members of the Common Council. The municipal corporations all over the kingdom followed the example. The spring assizes were just beginning, and at every county town the grand jurors and the justices of the peace put down their names. Soon shopkeepers, artisans, yeomen, farmers, husbandmen came by thousands to the tables where the parchments were laid out. In Westminster there were 37,000 associators, in the Tower Hamlets 8,000, in Southwark 18,000. The rural parts of Surrey furnished 17,000. At Ipswich all the freemen signed except two. At Warwick all the male inhabitants who had attained the age of 16 signed, except two papists and two Quakers. At Taunton, where the memory of the bloody circuit was fresh, every man who could write gave in his adhesion to the government. All the churches and all the meeting-houses in the town were crowded, as they had never been crowded before, with people who came to thank God for having preserved him whom they fondly called William the Deliverer. Of all the counties of England, Lancashire was the most Jacobitical. Yet Lancashire furnished fifty thousand signatures. Of all the great towns of England, Norwich was the most Jacobitical. The magistrates of that city were supposed to be in the interest of the exiled dynasty. The non-jurors were numerous, and had, just before the discovery of the plot, seemed to be in unusual spirits and ventured to take unusual liberties. One of the chief divines of the schism had preached a sermon there which gave rise to strange suspicions. He had taken for his text 
the verse in which the prophet Jeremiah announced that the day of vengeance was come, that the sword would be drunk with blood, that the Lord God of hosts had a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. Very soon it was known that at the time when this discourse was delivered, swords had actually been sharpening under the direction of Barclay and Parkins for a bloody sacrifice on the north bank of the river Thames. The indignation of the common people of Norwich was not to be restrained. They came in multitudes, though thoroughly discouraged by the municipal authorities, to plight faith to William, rightful and lawful king. In Norfolk the number of signatures amounted to forty-eight thousand, in Suffolk to seventy thousand. Upwards of five hundred rolls went up to London from every part of England. The number of names attached to twenty-seven of those rolls appears from the London Gazette to have been three hundred and fourteen thousand. After making the largest allowance for fraud, it seems certain that the association included the great majority of the adult male inhabitants of England who were able to sign their names. The tide of popular feeling was so strong that a man who was known not to have signed ran considerable risk of being publicly affronted. In many places nobody appeared without wearing in his hat a red ribbond on which were embroidered the words General Association for King William. Once a party of Jacobites had the courage to parade a street in London with an emblematic device which seemed to indicate their contempt for the new solemn league and covenant. They were instantly put to rout by the mob, and their leader was well ducked. The enthusiasm spread to secluded isles, to factories in foreign countries, to remote colonies. The association was signed by the rude fishermen of the Scilly Rocks, by the English merchants of Malaga, by the English merchants of Genoa, by the citizens of New York, by the tobacco planters of Virginia, and by the sugar planters of Barbados. Emboldened by success, the Whig leaders ventured to proceed a step further. They brought into the lower house a bill for the securing of the king's person and government. By this bill it was provided that whoever, while the war lasted, should come from France into England without the royal license, should incur the penalties of treason, that the suspension of the Habeas Corpus Act should continue to the end of the year, and that all functionaries appointed by William should retain their offices, notwithstanding his death, till his successor should be pleased to dismiss them. The form of association which the House of Commons had adopted was solemnly ratified, and it was provided that no person should sit in that house or should hold any office, civil or military, without signing. The lords were indulged in the use of their own form, and nothing was said about the clergy. The Tories, headed by Finch and Seymour, complained bitterly of this new test, and ventured once to divide, but were defeated. Finch seems to have been heard patiently, but notwithstanding all Seymour's eloquence, the contemptuous manner in which he spoke of the association raised a storm against which he could not stand. Loud cries of, The Tower, the Tower, were heard. Haughty and imperious as he was, he was forced to explain away his words, and could scarcely, by apologizing in a manner to which he was little accustomed, save himself from the humiliation of being called to the bar and reprimanded on his knees. The bill went up to the Lords and passed with great speed in spite of the opposition of Rochester and Nottingham. The nature and extent of the change which the discovery of the assassination plot had produced in the temper of the House of Commons and of the nation is strikingly illustrated by the history of a bill 
entitled a bill for the further regulation of elections of members of Parliament. The moneyed interest was almost entirely Whig, and was therefore an object of dislike to the Tories. The rapidly growing power of that interest was generally regarded with jealousy by landowners whether they were Whigs or Tories. It was something new and monstrous to see a trader from Lombard Street, who had no tie to the soil of our island, and whose wealth was entirely personal and movable, post down to Devonshire or Sussex, with a portmanteau full of guineas, offer himself as candidate for a borough in opposition to a neighbouring gentleman whose ancestors had been regularly returned ever since the Wars of the Roses, and come in at the head of the poll. Yet even this was not the worst. More than one seat in Parliament, it was said, had been bought and sold over a dish of coffee at Garraway's. The purchaser had not been required even to go through the form of showing himself to the electors. Without leaving his counting-house in Cheapside, he had been chosen to represent a place which he had never seen. Such things were intolerable. No man, it was said, ought to sit in the English legislature who was not a master of some hundreds of acres of English ground. A bill was accordingly brought in which provided that every member of the House of Commons must have a certain estate in land. For a knight of the shire the qualification was fixed at five hundred a year for a burgess at two hundred a year. Early in February this bill was read a second time and referred to a select committee. A motion was made that the committee should be instructed to add a clause enacting that all elections should be by ballot. Whether this motion proceeded from a Whig or a Tory, by what arguments it was supported, and on what grounds it was opposed, we have now no means of discovering. We only know that it was rejected without a division. Before the bill came back from the committee, some of the most respected constituent bodies in the kingdom had raised their voices against the new restriction to which it was proposed to subject them. There had, in general, been little sympathy between the commercial towns and the universities for the commercial towns were the chief seats of Whiggism and nonconformity, and the universities were zealous for the crown and the church. Now, however, Oxford and Cambridge made common cause with London and Bristol. It was hard, said the academics, that a grave and learned man, sent by a large body of grave and learned men to the great council of the nation, should be thought less fit to sit in that council than a boozing clown who had scarcely literature enough to entitle him to the benefit of clergy. It was hard, said the traders, that a merchant prince, who had been the first magistrate of the first city in the world, whose name on the back of a bill commanded entire confidence at Smyrna and at Genoa, at Hamburg and at Amsterdam, who had at sea ships every one of which was worth a manor, and who had repeatedly, when the liberty and religion of the kingdom were in peril, advanced to the government at an hour's notice five or ten thousand pounds, should be supposed to have a less stake in the prosperity of the commonwealth than a squire who sold his own bullocks and hops over a pot of ale at the nearest market town. On the report it was moved that the universities should be accepted, but the motion was lost by a hundred and fifty-one votes to a hundred and forty-three. On the third reading it was moved that the City of London should be accepted, but it was not thought advisable to divide. The final question that the bill do pass was carried by a hundred and seventy-three votes to a hundred and fifty on the day which preceded the discovery of the assassination plot. The Lords agreed to the bill 
without any amendment. William had to consider whether he would give or withhold his assent. The commercial towns of the kingdom, and among them the city of London, which had always stood firmly by him, and which had extricated him many times from great embarrassments, implored his protection. It was represented to him that the commons were far indeed from being unanimous on this subject, that in the last stage the majority had been only twenty-three in a full house, that the motion to accept the universities had been lost by a majority of only eight. On full consideration he resolved not to pass the bill. Nobody, he said, could accuse him of acting selfishly on this occasion. His prerogative was not concerned in the matter, and he could have no objection to the proposed law except that it would be mischievous to his people. On the 10th of April, 1696, therefore, the clerk of the Parliament was commanded to inform the Houses that the King would consider of the bill for the further regulation of elections. Some violent Tories in the House of Commons flattered themselves that they might be able to carry a resolution reflecting on the King. They moved that whoever had advised His Majesty to refuse his assent to their bill was an enemy to him and to the nation. Never was a greater blunder committed. The temper of the House was very different from what it had been on the day when the address against Portland's grant had been voted by acclamation. The detection of a murderous conspiracy, the apprehension of a French invasion, had changed everything. The King was popular. Every day ten or twelve bales of parchment, covered with the signatures of associators, were laid at his feet. Nothing could be more imprudent than to propose at such a time a thinly disguised vote of censure on him. The moderate Tories accordingly separated themselves from their angry and unreasonable brethren. The motion was rejected by two hundred and nineteen votes to seventy, and the House ordered the question and the numbers on both sides to be published in order that the world might know how completely the attempt to produce a quarrel between the King and the Parliament had failed. The country gentlemen might perhaps have been more inclined to resent the loss of their bill had they not been put into high good humour by another bill which they considered as even more important. The project of a land bank had been revived not in the form in which it had two years before been brought under the consideration of the House of Commons, but in a form much less shocking to common sense and less open to ridicule. Chamberlain, indeed, protested loudly against all modifications of his plan, and proclaimed with undiminished confidence that he would make all his countrymen rich if they would only let him. He was not, he said, the first great discoverer whom princes and statesmen had regarded as a dreamer. Henry the Seventh had, in an evil hour, refused to listen to Christopher Columbus. The consequence had been that England had lost the mines of Mexico and Peru. Yet what were the mines of Mexico and Peru to the riches of a nation blessed with an unlimited paper currency? But the united force of reason and ridicule had reduced the once numerous sect which followed Chamberlain to a small and select company of incorrigible fools. Few even of the squires now believed in his two great doctrines. The doctrine that the state can, by merely calling a bundle of old rags ten million sterling, add ten millions sterling to the riches of the nation, and the doctrine that a lease of land for a term of years may be worth many times the fee simple. But it was still the general opinion of the country gentlemen that a bank, 
of which it should be the special business to advance money on the security of land, might be a great blessing to the nation. Harley and the Speaker Foley now proposed that such a bank be established by Act of Parliament, and promised that, if their plan was adopted, the King should be amply supplied with money for the next campaign. The Whig leaders, and especially Montague, saw that the scheme was a delusion, that it must speedily fail, and that before it failed it might not improbably ruin their own favourite institution, the Bank of England. But on this point they had against them not only the whole Tory party, but also their master and many of their followers. The necessities of the state were pressing. The offers of the projectors were tempting. A Bank of England had, in return for its charter, advanced to the state only one million at eight per cent. The land bank would advance more than two millions and a half at seven per cent. William, whose chief object was to procure money for the service of the year, was little inclined to find fault with any source from which two millions and a half could be obtained. Sunderland, who generally exerted his influence in favour of the Whig leaders, failed them on this occasion. The Whig country gentlemen were delighted by the prospect of being able to repair their stables, replenish their cellars, and give portions to their daughters. It was impossible to contend against such combination of force. A bill was passed which authorised the government to borrow two million five hundred and sixty four thousand pounds at seven per cent. A fund arising chiefly from a new tax on salt was set apart for the payment of the interest. If before the first of August the subscription for one half of this loan should have been filled, and if one half of the sum subscribed should have been paid into the exchequer, the subscribers were to become a corporate body under the name of the National Land Bank. As this bank was expressly intended to accommodate country gentlemen, it was strictly interdicted from lending money on any private security other than a mortgage of land, and was bound to lend on mortgage at least half a million annually. The interest on this half million was not to exceed three and a half per cent if the payments were quarterly, or four per cent if the payments were half yearly. At that time the market rate of interest on the best mortgages was full six per cent. The shrewd observers at the Dutch embassy therefore thought that capitalists would eschew all connection with what must necessarily be a losing concern, and that the subscription would never be half filled up, and it seems strange that any sane person would have thought otherwise. It was vain, however, to reason against the general infatuation. The Tories exultingly predicted that the bank of Robert Harley would completely eclipse the bank of Charles Montague. The bill passed both houses. On the 27th of April it received the royal assent, and the Parliament was immediately afterwards prorogued. End of section 14. End of chapter 21 of the History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay.